Hey what's up guys, my name is Eterno, welcome back to the Game Engine series. Yes, we are back. This is not abandoned. Um, I know it's been a very long time since the last episode and I apologize for that. I've been super busy with like working on Hazel Dev and other kind of YouTube videos. But I didn't want to totally forget about this series. I have been kind of thinking about it at the in the back of my mind. And I think what we're going to do today is, is something a little bit different than we usually do. So we agreed that the format kind of going forward would be more or less me live streaming myself working on this and then kind of making that into a video. But um, today I think is gonna be pretty cool because what we're gonna do today is we're gonna have a go at implementing a content browser panel. Um, and I'll show you what that is in a minute. But basically, this is something that I haven't uh, prepared. This is, this is not something that I've like live streamed and I'm not gonna just drag the code in. I'm actually gonna take you through my process of doing something like this from start to finish. I don't know what it's gonna turn out kind of looking like. Again, as I mentioned, I haven't really done anything like this before, but hopefully it will kind of enlighten, um, you know, you guys and maybe show you a little bit more of like the thought process that goes into something like that and how I would approach it in almost like kind of an unedited fashion. I do kind of think there will be some editing going on because I'm sure that there'll be cases in which I'm just gonna stare at it and not know how to do something in I am GUI and there might be like minutes of me just reading documentation or code, which I'm sure you don't wanna see. But anyway, we'll see how we go. So first step, I want to, I want to kind of, um, you know, talk about where we left off. So we have um, Hazel here, which of course is committed on GitHub. We have this scene, pink cube, and we can load all of this stuff. So what do I wanna do and where, where are we taking this going forward? So we have this sprite renderer that's capable of rendering a sprite of a given color. That's fine, but I think the next big step here is to actually be able to render textured sprites. So if we can render a texture on this thing, which we can, like our 2D renderer definitely supports textures. We just have no way of doing it through like the editor in interface. So if we could do that, then I think that we're pretty much at the stage where we could make almost any 2D game. Like we would need to script it through C++. We don't have like C Sharp or any other scripting language. So there is that kind of limitation. And then also, um, you know, some other kind of components like audio aren't really present. But in terms of actual gameplay, you know, if we can make entities move programmatically, which we can, and if we can apply a texture to a quad, then that's pretty much any 2D game you could think of. That's most of the work kind of done because it is kind of easy to do that. A lot of the other logic lies in the actual programming on not necessarily like the features that the editor or the renderer has to provide, which is pretty cool. So that's kind of my, my line of thinking here. You know, we're kind of moving towards being able to complete like a 2D game. That's like the goal. And these are kind of the steps to get us there. So in order to actually render textures, we have a few options. I mean, I could have gone the easy route, which now that I think back, I'm not sure why I didn't. But ultimately, um, what I could do is just add a little like texture field over here in this sprite renderer with, with like a little open button. You could click it. It could open like you know, a kind of open file dialogue like this. And then you could just navigate to like assets, textures and load something, right? But instead of doing that, what I thought would, um, what I thought would be cooler and a little bit more kind of uh, along the lines of what we would expect from this engine in the future is if we actually had like down here, like a content browser panel that would let us kind of navigate our project and just drag a texture that we could maybe even preview a thumbnail of right into that slot. Right, so we would click here and we would drag it into this slot and suddenly we would be rendering that texture instead of this color or maybe in addition to this color. So the color would tint the texture and we would set it to white if we wanted to like not tint it or something. So um, that's basically the kind of outline of why we're doing this. Now, what is a content browser panel? That is a great question. Let's go ahead and launch Hazel Dev, which by the way, you guys can get access to if you go to patreon.com slash the channel and help support everything that I'm doing here on YouTube as well as Hazel's development, then you will basically get access to this, um, which is uh, Hazel Dev. Um, and I'm right in the middle of <laughs> playing around with like a little Bloom, Bloom implementation, which at the moment is uh, not going too well. But anyway, inside Hazel Dev, we have this content browser panel. Now I didn't make this, this was made by Peter, um, uh, who is listed over here as part of the Hazel core team, by the way. So huge thank you to him for making this. But basically what this is, is this content browser panel. We can search here, you know, we can navigate through the entire repository. We can go to like 
um, well, in, in the, I guess in the uh, um, spirit of textures, let's go to like, I don't even know if we have like proper textures here. We have meshes um, and then maybe we have like uh, source, you know, we have like some textures here, right? These are some textures we could essentially, and I think we can even um, click on this and like take this albedo and drag it in here. Wow, that works. That's nice. I haven't actually tested that in a while, so it's nice that it works. But anyway, you, you get the point. So I kind of want this functionality um, for us to be able to kind of navigate our repository and then just drag this like into a into an actual texture slot um, as opposed to having to like open a file from disk. So how do we achieve something like that? Well, uh, that's a good question. Let's begin. So the first thing I want to do is think about where this belongs. Now, a content browser panel is definitely not something we would probably ever have in the runtime. There are a lot of cases for having these content kind of panels in the actual runtime. So meaning I would want to put it into Hazel, not Hazel Nut. Uh, like, for example, like a scene hierarchy panel. Why would you ever want that in Hazel's runtime? Um, this is actually a question that gets asked pretty often, like in the Patreon chat or in like, I get like messages about it every now and then. The reason is, um, and Hazel Dev does this quite a lot with a lot of its panels actually, is because just because something can be used in the editor and seems like it only should be used in the editor doesn't mean it's not a useful tool to have for debugging. So in other words, like pretend that you are trying to debug your scene on like an Android phone. Right, not that Hazel supports Android, but if it did, you know, you're on your Android phone and you just want to like debug, you know, why is my entity not there? Or like, where is it? Is it even in the scene? Right, so you bring up the scene hierarchy panel right there on your phone, which you can obviously do because it's all IAM GUI. It's not written in like Qt or WPF or something like that. It's all IAM GUI, so it's all just C rendering, right? Um, you can bring it up and you can be like, oh, okay. It is in my scene. And then you can click on it and see that it's transform is like way off. So something went wrong with the transform. I think you kind of get you kind of get the point. So basically it, it's kind of it, these those panels aren't really useful for like a shipping game, but it is still useful for debugging and like maybe QA testing and all of that stuff. So whenever I kind of make tools for the editor, I always think about whether or not it's actually something that we want to have for the runtime. And I think that in this case, it definitely is, or rather definitely is not. A content browser panel is something that displays a folder that we have on our computer with assets that we may or may not want to use, right? We're not trying to make an editor for like our phones in terms of debugging. I don't really need the ability to drag in certain assets that the engine might not even be using. That's a bit weird. Um, so it's clearly something that we would much rather have just for the editor. So in that case, it should work with just the editor. So we have a scene hierarchy panel. That's actually a good point. So in Hazelnut, I'm um, sorry, in Hazel Dev, this is not part of the uh, Hazelnut thing. It's actually part of Hazel, and that's kind of why. So at the moment, we've um, we've made it part of uh, Hazelnut, which is okay. But I kind of uh, did give my reasons as to why we might not want that. Okay. So content browser panel. This is kind of nice. It feels like one of those old school episodes where we actually write all the code live, which is fun. So we'll include our little pre-compiled header and we'll include content browser panel. And let's take a look at what we want to have here. So um, I don't know if we follow any kind of like pattern with our panels. Not really. I mean, what we kind of want is usually some kind of context. Now in the future, we'll have projects and like a project will contain like an assets directory. And then we'll, that's basically the directory that we'll be browsing. At the moment, we just have this assets folder relative to our current working directory. So we'll kind of assume that that's what we want. Uh, but in the future, we'll probably take in an actual project into the constructor. Other than that, and that will kind of be the context. Um, other than that, we basically just have on I'm GUI render, I guess, and then just like a default dis, uh, constructor. And that's probably it. So content browser panel. Uh, let's see. So we'll have that on I'm GUI render. We'll have uh, just a default constructor. And I'm sure we'll need like some private variables and some other stuff as well. Okay. So let's try and create this. Uh, 
Um, okay, so on I'm GUI render, what is that going to do? So again, um, let's go to like scene hierarchy panel and just see like what the basic idea is for like creating panels and stuff. So we begin, um, and this is really just to save time. It's not that I don't know how to do this. Uh, it's not that it's complicated. It's just that if you can copy and paste code from somewhere, it's usually a good, good way to go. Um, you know, if it depends where from and stuff, depends what the code is, but it's usually okay. All right, so here we draw obviously um, every kind of entity node. So, so what do we wanna do here? Well, for the content browser panel, um, the first step really is we kind of want to, and don't forget by the way that I'm GUI is obviously an immediate mode GUI. Basically means that like, you know, we do expect to run through this code, like every kind of frame. So you have to be a little bit sensitive to like performance considerations as well. Now, I don't think this is a big deal, um, but what we could do uh, is basically just list all the files in the assets directory. So what I'll do at the moment is I'll just say const expression like std uh, string, and we'll call this our kind of assets directory. And I'll set it equal to assets. Now I will say here, um, now, do we not have a constant string? Can string not be a constant expression? I guess not. Well, it's not a big deal, I guess, but that's a bit annoying. Anyway, um, so we'll say that this is uh, to, be <laughs> to be changed. So once we have um, projects change this, so for now, it's kind of just hard-coded to be assets, but in the future, we will change this. Okay, so content browser. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll actually use the file system that we have in C++17, because the file system has uh, something called a directory iterator. Um, and this iterator means that we can basically just iterate through a directory, which I have no idea how to do. So let's just Go ahead and Google this, and we will see how we can use this. Okay, so we have this example here from CPP reference. Um, we can uh, basically iterate through, so, oh, so we just have like a file system directory iterator, and then we get P, which is a path. So let's go ahead and try something like this, basically, right? So I'm, I'll go ahead and, um, so this will be a for loop, auto P, directory system, uh, for, sorry, file system uh, directory iterator, and then we'll have our assets directory. And then we can get the path here, we can get like the parent path if we want like the directory or whatever. Um, and I'm not like as far as like uh, recursive direct directories go and stuff, I think we'll probably have to deal with that in a slightly different way, which we will do in a minute. Okay, so what's next? So Let's go ahead and since we are inside an I'm GUI kind of context, let's go ahead and just render this as text, right? So I'll say we'll do like percentage S um, and then we will just put basically P. Uh, what is P first of all? P is a directory entry, path is the path, and then we can just do dot string. I don't want to do dot C string or anything because I don't know what the lifetime of that object will be. Probably not, that is a const reference actually, so I'm sure it'll be fine. But we'll just have it as a string, I guess. Um, so that'll be our string. Uh, and then we'll put in path. So it's pretty exciting to have something like this because uh, before C++17, you basically had to use like the Win32 API or like whatever your kind of um, Windows, I guess, uh, sorry, not Windows, operating system API was. So it's nice to have something like this for sure. Okay, content, content browser panel. Just duplicate this, content browser panel. Content browser panel, I'm gonna have dreams about this content browser panel. So let's go up here. Why did we create this? Oh, it's, it's just a, uh, it doesn't really need to be created, does it? It's just a stack allocated thing. So we just need to call on I'm GUI render basically. So where do we do that for the scene hierarchy panel? Probably in this function. Yep. Now it's a good thing in the future to just start maybe adding a, adding these to a list so you don't have to literally have like every panel here. And by list, I mean like some kind of vector. 
But let's take a look at this. So we should be already kind of at the point where we should see um, every single, uh, I guess, directory or path really that exists. So this is kind of exciting. It's like the beginning of our content browser panel. Let's just dock it maybe down here. It's a nice spot for it. So we have assets uh, cache, assets fonts, assets scenes, assets shaders, assets textures. So you can see, first of all, that um, there's a few things here. So we have backslashes. We also have uh, so texture, shaders, scenes, fonts, cache. So this is everything. And it's also relative to the working directory, it seems, because it includes assets itself. So that's what we have in here. Now, because we're doing this every frame at the moment, uh, the cool thing is, is that if I like add a file here, Cherno.txt. You can see it's literally here, right? So in like two seconds, we've like already created something that can just, you know, be almost used as a content browser. People say C++ is slow to work with. Um, <laughs> so let's delete that. It disappears. Great. So all we want to do now is probably trim that kind of working directory situation. Um, and also make a recursive function out of this. But the thing is, we don't really need to have it be a recursive function. All we need to do is enable us to actually browse two paths. So what I'm going to do is, as a very simple case, I'm going to change this to be a button instead. And we're going to say that basically what this is going to be um, is uh, if we if we click on that button, I want to try and navigate to that directory. Now, it's very important to also distinguish between what is a directory and what is a file, because um, if it's a... Uh, if it's not a directory, then like, what are you doing, right? So if it is a directory, let's go ahead and add this kind of functionality to it. So I'll add a button. Um, I guess will it be a button. Yeah, we might make it a button either way. We'll see. Um, I'll have path here maybe. But basically, if it is a directory, um, we'll render the button. And then if the button is pressed, um, then we want to actually navigate into that directory. So how do we do that? Well, we have to keep track of some kind of path that we're currently on. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'll just treat this as like a file system path. By the way, this is a definitely something worth noting. If you're unfamiliar with this file system thing that uh, exists in like C++, 17, uh, it's in, it, like it, this, uh, this, this came up in the Hazel core team. Um, and I think that it's something that's definitely worth mentioning. Uh, it's really quite important to understand what classes actually are, right? Classes are obviously containers of like data of certain like variables ultimately. Uh, and that's what kind of makes up a certain class. It's I think it's important to understand what a class is, right? So in the case of this kind of um, path class, uh, and there's a lot of stuff here. So I'm just trying to kind of make this a little bit easier so we can at least see what this is. So like line 14, 29 is roughly where it ends. You can see that basically the only thing that is inside this path class, at least the MSVC kind of, you know, Visual Studio implementation is string type text. Now, what is string type? String type in this case is a wide string. Now, a wide string is a wide char, right? Um, so not like a UTF-8 thing, but like a 16-bit kind of character. Now, um, that being said, uh, that's all a path is. It's not some magical file that contains like some crazy file system link or like open handle to like, you know, a folder on your computer or something weird. It's just a string. It's, it's a wide string, right? So, uh, don't be like too afraid of like, you know, if you have to toss up between like, I'd rather store it as a string because that's probably more efficient than a file system handle. It's not a file system handle. Um, it's an actual, uh, it's just a, it is a string. So it's kind of, you know, let this kind of be just hopefully something that you guys can think about in the future. Not when it comes to maybe this specifically, but just in general, just be aware of the data that you're actually manipulating because it's easy with kind of higher level languages to just forget, you know, what is happening underneath all of that abstraction that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that, that makes up all of your code, basically. So I'll say current directory, um, and that will be, that will be uh, what we're currently on. So again, uh, you know, on upon construction, um, so I'm actually going to create a little constructor here, we're going to actually set this to be the assets directory. Uh, so let me just take this away. So we're going to just set this to be the assets directory. And I guess we could do it up here. 
Um, so what happens is when I actually navigate to a directory, it's, what I want to do is kind of simple. So first of all, uh, it's important to like notice that um, when we actually printed this out, it was pretty clear to us that it was like assets backslash whatever, right? So because of that, we don't really care too much about the um, whole assets slash thing because everything is going to be relative to assets. Now, if we really wanted to deal with that, we could just use there. There's like a relative function inside the file system API that's actually quite useful. But instead, of, instead of what we can do um, and what we need to think about is that if we're currently in the assets directory and we see something like assets slash, you know, what was here, like shaders or whatever, we want to enter into that directory, then we can't just take like assets or our current directory, which is assets and try and append this to it. Because if we do that, then we wind up with assets slash assets slash shaders. So what we really want is because obviously we're just displaying stuff that's in the current directory, we just want this last part. Um, and there's a few ways that we can do this. So I think if we just do p, um, so okay, once we actually have the path, right? Or p.path is the path, kind of. Why does it keep doing that? Um, then we have, uh, so stem, I think will, it might be stem, it might be like file name or something. I don't know, to be honest, but I'm pretty sure that file name will actually give us the, um, so let's maybe take a look at, and again, you know, this is, this is where some debugging is kind of nice. So let's just, I don't know why I've decided to to do this, let's let's not do that. Um, we might as well just I'm GUI it, right? So let's just do p.path.file name. I'll do I am GUI text, um, and then this will be p.path.file name dot string dot. I'm a little bit scared about using C string because I feel like um, I feel like it won't actually have that memory for us. So let's just do p0, p1. So I want the file name and the stem. I just want to see what they are because I have a feeling that. So this is the file name. This is the stem. So one thing I like to do quite often is actually to validate like the data that I'm dealing with, right? So I don't, li I like to be aware of what everything is. Um, yeah, so see C and yeah, okay. So uh, this is what happens when we don't, it's because they're wide characters. So we have to actually do dot string. Otherwise we just get like the first character because it runs into a null terminator, null termination character really quickly. So cache, cache. Okay, so in this case, they actually return the same thing. So what stem does traditionally is just, it just returns the name without the extension. So if I had something like that churno.txt file or whatever, right, cherno.txt, you can see that in this case, the file name is cherno.txt, but the stem is cherno. So if you want to get the um, the file name without the extension, then uh, that's what stem is. But in this case, folders don't have extensions. Um, but what if we had a folder with an extension though? I don't think, would that matter? So like, you know, test.txt. Uh huh. See, so the file name is test the text. The stem is test, even though it's still a folder. So that just proves that we actually want to use. Um, well, yeah, that makes sense, obviously. But like, we actually want to use file name and not stem for this because if we use stem, then some folders will be treated weirdly. So we're already checking to make sure it's a directory. So that's fine. So if we do this, then all we really want to do is current directory. We do this little divided by equals because that's the operator that they've overloaded, um, which is quite funny, I think. But it's I guess it's kind of nice because it looks like a path. Um, and then we put in uh, the file name, right? So this is a string file name. Um, oh, yeah, we don't actually need to convert it into a string. We can just do that because we're appending a path, we don't need to waste time making it into a string. Because it stores a wide string natively, there is a bit of a conversion cost when we go from a wide string to a string. Um, and also, you generally want to probably avoid using strings. Um, we should be using some kind of UTF-8 um, strings or something like that, just because at the moment, I don't think this will actually support, at least not in this way, it probably won't support like other languages. So like, 
That's actually worth testing because that's a common problem people run into as well. So if I try to make a, I'm just trying to make a folder, but I'll call it something in Russian. So like Privyat. Um, well, we just got a crash. So good example of what not to do, right? Um, and the reason that, that happened is because we probably should have used a wide string. I don't even know if I'm GUI properly supports wide strings or we should have done a conversion. I'm not sure why this crashed though, because string should have actually tried to convert it into a char string like that. Anyway, we'll investigate other languages in the future, but it was worth, um, it's just worth kind of being aware of. It's not, not, it's not that it's worth being aware, but it's nice to be aware of certain things that may crash your program. And dealing with strings properly is definitely something that a lot of people get wrong all the time, including myself, obviously. So anyway, uh, current directory. Um, yeah, so now we're actually changing the current directory. Now at the moment, again, we're doing a directory iterator over assets directory. We're gonna change that now to be the current directory. And by doing so, I think we've just created a bit of a, like a explorer kind of thing that can't go back. So this is our little quest into creating Windows Explorer. We better delete that Russian folder. And that's why, Russians are dangerous because they can crash everything. All right, so um, asset scenes, uh, I guess there's nothing in there. Let's quickly make a little back thing. So um, it's worth not displaying a back button past assets. We don't really wanna give people access to the whole computer through this thing, um, probably at least. So um, we'll think about that as well. But as, as we iterate through this, um, if let's just do this. So if the current directory, doesn't equal um, scd file system path assets directory, which I feel I should have just made into a directory, um, then uh, we'll have a little back button, which I will just call, well, maybe I'll just do that, which is our back button. And if it's pressed, then all I'm going to do is basically, so this is if it's not the assets directory, I guess. Um, if it's not, if it's, or it's, or if it's empty, I guess it can't be empty, right? Cause this will always be relative to what, like the working directory. We probably want it to be relative to the assets directory though. I don't know. It, it gets a little bit tricky, I think here, but basically we'll, we'll just do, um, current directory equals current directory dot parent, parent path. Um, and that's pretty much it. I don't know how this will work. If at all it will, let's just try just because like, we're not really we're not really doing relative paths to like assets or anything. Um, yeah. Okay. So we don't have a back part. We don't have a back button, but now we do. So actually it turns out it works perfectly. Um, so assets, shaders, assets, scenes, assets, fonts, open sans. Um, let's maybe display files as well. So we still want to display files. It's just that, and let's just display them as buttons. So they don't look weird, but we, we basically just won't make the button do any, we'll make the button not do anything. So, so path.cstring I think is reasonable. Oh, no, no, hang on. That's not reasonable at all. Actually, none of this is reasonable, is it? Because, yeah, because it's displaying everything. So let's let's kind of switch up a bit. So what I will do is, okay, so the first step um, into kind of formatting this so that, it, so that it looks a bit nicer is we want to make sure that we're relative to assets. How do we do that? So there's something called, um, and where shall we do this? Maybe like here. So SCD file system relative, um, and then this will return a path that's relative like to something else. So um, basically what we'll do is we'll put the path in first, which is simply p.path. And then the base path is actually what we specify here. So the base path will be um, uh, the assets directory basically. So. Hold up a second. I just want to do this. Um, okay, this is probably just better to do asset path um, instead of this this clown. So maybe let's get rid of that. I guess I'll make a const. Um, okay. 
So asset path we have here now, and that's that. So now I can obviously just type that in. I don't have to go from the string to path conversion anymore. It's just a path already. So yeah, so I guess the moral of the story as, as to what I was talking about with this and like be aware of what path is, is that now you don't really have to worry about paths really ever being strings, right? Paths are always capable of being not just ASCII, right? We just demonstrated that by trying to make a Russian path and seeing it crash, um, right? So in other words, keeping it a string doesn't really make much sense. And if you want to keep it as a wide string or a UTF-8 string or whatever else, um, then it's, uh, it's the same essentially as just keeping it as a path. So... What's the downside of keeping it as a path? Nothing really. The only real difference between path and string really is just the API that it gives you, the functions you can call on the actual variable. That's really the only difference. So in other words, now hopefully, um, it'll be something that you kind of think about when you make a path. Um, it feels like I'm kind of talking down on you guys. I'm, not what I'm doing. I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm almost frustrated as, at my own experiences in the past. Uh, and that's kind of what's, what's coming through here. So let's set this to asset path. Okay, so um, yeah, so we have this, we have this, great. So relative to that, and that's kind of the path I wanna deal with. So this is, um, let's maybe call this IT for like kind of iterator. So this is like the actual in, the actual kind of variable that we're iterating through, um, even, and that's a directory entry. Actually, I'll call it a directory entry. I think that's a bit better, directory entry. Um, and then this path, what do we even use this for? So we use it for C string here, and it's, that's just going to be a string. Um, sure, I might just call it path string though. And then this, which I use a lot, I might just const reference path, just to tidy this up a bit. Okay, so path, path string, relative. So um, this is going to be a order relative path. Um, and then this relative path is actually what I kind of want to use. So let's do relative path string and that will be this. And that is what we will use everywhere. So now we shouldn't have any of that, um, uh, any of that kind of absolute, well, not absolute, but relative to the working directory path coming through. So we should only really have the name. So current directory, let's see. So, and what do we add to it? Just path file name, which is that original path file name. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, let's go ahead and try and run that. Okay, so cache, churn.txt, fonts, scenes. If we click on the file, nothing happens. If we go into fonts, uh, we get the back button. We can see this. Um, and here are all our files. We can go back. We can't go back past this. Textures. Okay, so we actually still still have textures slash blah, blah, blah. That's okay. Um, I think it's just because, yeah. So we've got the relative path, which I think is probably worth having. Um, but we obviously don't really want to display the relative path string. We want to actually display display just like the file name string. So how do we do that? Um, I guess, yeah, I guess we don't need this at all actually. So file name string is going to be a lot relative path dot file name dot string. Um, and that's actually what we'll use here. And actually while I'm here, I think what I might do is I was gonna use like a larger font because it's kind of hard to see. But to be honest, maybe for these videos, I'll just kind of try and leave the font like larger. Because I think at the moment, what are we doing? We're doing like um, default is like 18. So like, you know, I should make like if recording video <laughs> uh, bigger, but like, let's just do like font size times two or something um, just so that Maybe it'll be easier for you guys to see. It's almost hard for me to see. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Let me know if that's better. Um, so yeah, so here, here are all of our files, fonts, open sans, um, shaders, our shaders, and then obviously like textures. And so like the next step really is going to be to kind of take this texture um, which at the moment is showing up as this. It'd be nice to kind of display it like as an icon, obviously. By the way, I'm not spending too much time at the moment, at least tweaking this and making it all like a beautiful layout. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, we're just trying to make this functionally work first. 
um, because obviously like in terms of like layout and stuff, um, we, uh, yeah, we, we definitely don't need to, I think, worry too much about that. And you can, I'm sure you guys could figure out a certain layout in Lime GUI if you wanted to. And that's also something that you could spend hours on. Uh, and I'm definitely guilty of that. Uh, another thing you could do, by the way, is I'm not sure how taxing this is in terms of performance, to be completely honest, but you could obviously just like not do this if you've done it once, like if, as in, if you've iterated through the directory once, you can actually save every like directory entry into like some kind of list if you wanted to, and then simply go through that list every frame to render it, but not actually hit the file system every frame like this to get all the information out from it. Um, or maybe you could just do it once per second. And if you did it once per second, that way you could still pick up new files, right? So I think that's kind of just useful, right? Because you'll see files kind of uh, change and stuff. Because obviously at the moment, like if I'm inside like fonts, and I add a new font folder or whatever, it's going to appear here instantly, which is kind of nice, right? Um, because it's all kind of live. Uh, so that's definitely an another idea. But I think next time what we'll do is, um, let's just load up a scene. Um, next time what we'll do is we'll actually try and have, and of course the font size being so large kind of ruins everything. But what we'll try and do is add like a little texture slot here that we can actually go into like textures and actually like try and like say drag this Cherno logo onto here. So that is the plan. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. Let me know what you thought of this kind of more almost casual approach. Um, I'm definitely not saying that the series is gonna become this from now on. I probably will go back to like live streaming this for more serious things and kind of, uh, you know, working on it. It's just that because I have been so busy working on some really exciting features for Hazel um, and for like for Hazel Dev, uh, it's just, Honestly, I'm just flat out at the moment and just didn't have time to actually probably sit down and kind of, uh, you know, plan this out and do a series of live streams and then show you the finished implementation. But I also thought that it, it would be, it might be beneficial and fun for you guys to kind of watch how I go about doing something like this. Anyway, thank you guys again for your support. You can support the series by going to patreon.com slash the and you'll get access to Hazel Dev um, and all of that uh, lovely uh, kind of other community stuff. And, um, yeah, next time, as I mentioned, we'll probably continue working on the content browser and try and set up textures because the next kind of step there is also the kind of the material workflow. We want to be able to probably create materials and specify maybe even custom shaders and stuff like that so that we can actually start kind of building these 2D games. Anyway, huge thank you to all of you guys for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.